Well, the title of my talk is Keys to Greatness. I should say something about why I want to give this presentation. I, I typically have been very skeptical of motivational speaking as an adult. And that's because I think that it's possible for us to be motivated in ways that aren't good for us, that pump us up, in ways that pump us up that are unhelpful rather than helpful. Particularly those kinds of ways that encourage us never to look at those parts of our character that need to be changed for the better. Well, a couple of years ago, as part of my graduate work in philosophy at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, I started reading Thomas Morris, who is a motivational speaker, and he is the head of what is called the Morris Institute for Human Values. And he's also a first-rate philosopher. He taught at Notre Dame for 15 years and inspired a lot of students. It made me rethink my skepticism about the proper use of motivation. When we think of greatness, we often think of people who are politicians, writers, maybe visionary entrepreneurs, and we don't tend to think of ourselves as possibly achieving greatness ourselves. So I want to take a bit of a different slant on the notion of greatness and say what Martin Luther King Jr. said, and that is if we all consider ourselves, if we all consider ourselves to be servants of others, then all of us have the potential to be great. Because true greatness does involve service to others. The two men I'm going to talk about still serve us, even though they've been dead for, for quite some time. Abraham Lincoln is one of the great politicians of world history, let alone American history. And C.S. Lewis is one of the great writers of the 20th century whose books have never gone out of print. Both men still inspire us. Both men can still challenge us if we're open to listen to what they have to say. I want to read two quotations, one about C.S. Lewis and one about Abraham Lincoln. The first about C.S. Lewis was actually written by a friend of his, a poet by the name of Ruth Pitter. And this is what she says about her friend, C.S. Lewis. His whole life was oriented and motivated by an almost uniquely persisting child sense of glory and of nightmare. The adult events were received into a medium still as pliable as wax, wide open to the glory, and equally vulnerable, with a man's strength to feel it all, and a great scholar's and writer's skills to express and to interpret. Wouldn't it be great if we had a friend who would be honest enough to show us our faults, but at the same time, gracious enough to write something like that about us if it were genuinely felt. Leo Tolstoy, the great 19th century Russian novelist, said this of Abraham Lincoln. The greatness of Napoleon, Caesar, or Washington is only moonlight by the son of Lincoln. His example is universal and will last thousands of years. He was bigger than his country bigger than all the presidents together. And as a great character, he will live as long as the world lives. Based on these passages, it's safe to say that both Lincoln and C.S. Lewis have left an impressive legacy. All of us should want to leave behind an impressive legacy, whether the world takes notice of it or not. So what are some things that these two men did that made them great and consequently have the potential to make us great if we follow their example? I have seven things. Number one, be willing to fail. Often we refuse to take steps to pursue the next thing in life that we want to pursue because we're afraid we will fail at it. Lincoln ran for the Senate twice and failed to get elected twice. The first time he gave away 
his nomination to someone who was able to support his ideas because he knew that if he didn't, he would not only lose, but his opponent would win and his ideas would not be implemented. C.S. Lewis fought in the First World War, lost one of his best friends during the conflict, came back to England and took the entrance exams to get into Oxford University. He failed the math portion of the exam. If it hadn't been for the fact that he was a veteran of World War I, they, they, he would not have gotten in. We might not have ever heard of him. So failure does not always have to be bad. To never fail is to never try anything and to always play it safe. I'll tell you about a failure of mine. It's not as serious as either uh, Lincoln's or Lewis's failure, but it was a failure on my part. My wife and I had been married for about a week and we decided to order pizza. And we get the knock on the door and we say, who is it? Nobody answers. Again, we say, who is it? And nobody answers. You know, we get closer to the door and by this time we can smell the pizza. And we're like, oh yeah, the pizza's here. So we open the door and we start talking to the pizza delivery, the delivery man. You know, how are you tonight? Nice evening out, isn't it? This guy still would not answer, wouldn't say a word. My wife finally gets into this poor guy's face and she says, why won't you talk to us? And the only words this man uttered that night were, I'm deaf. Epic fail, all right? I mean, the blind and the deaf do not often meet together to do business together. So this was, this was bad, really bad. Now, I did the very thing to this man that I hate people doing to me. I started talking louder and slower. I said, will you please help us write out a check? I, and I don't know why I did that. I didn't change the nature of the situation at all. He couldn't hear me no matter how slow or how loudly I talked. And I realized from that moment that I had failed in the sense that the very thing that I criticize in others was something that I was doing myself before I was even aware that that's what I was doing. That's a valuable lesson to learn because it helps you to be a little bit more watchful toward yourself and a little bit more tender toward others when they don't treat you the way you think you ought to be treated. Number two, be willing always to demonstrate forgiveness. In the 1850s, Lincoln practiced law in Springfield, Illinois. And there was a huge patent case that came up for consideration and Lincoln was asked to be the prosecuting attorney for this case. The case was, the trial was going to be held in Chicago. Well, in the process, the case, the trial was moved to Ohio and Lincoln was not notified of the fact that he had been replaced by a better lawyer by the name of Edwin Stanton. Abraham Lincoln prepares his brief, he gets his argument together and heads to Ohio, not realizing that he's been replaced. When he gets there and realizes that Stanton is going to be the prosecuting attorney instead of Lincoln, what do you think Lincoln did? Most of us, I suspect, would have been angry and humiliated, and no doubt Abraham Lincoln was both of those things but he stayed in Ohio to listen to Stanton's arguments in order to become better at his own practice of law. Six years later, when he's elected President of the United States, he shows himself to be extremely forgiving by giving Stanton the post of Secretary of War. That takes real humility. And it takes a willingness to recognize that what matters, what mattered for Lincoln, was not his own personal feelings, but what was good for the country. Stanton later said of Lincoln that he was one of his greatest friends. Number three, cultivate 
genuine friendship. C.S. Lewis writes this. Friendship arises when two or more people discover that they have in common some insight or interest. The man who agrees with us that some question, little regarded by others, is of great importance, can be our friend. That is why those pathetic people who simply want friends can never make any. The very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Where the truthful answer to the question, do you see the same truth, would be, I don't care about the truth, I only want you to be my friend, no friendship can arise. Friendship must be about something, even if it were only an enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. And C.S. Lewis's words here are, are quite powerful because they get at something I think we all genuinely want. We want friends who are genuine. Most of us don't want friends who simply want friends. Loneliness is never, almost never, a good reason for entering into a friendship. Because often, people who are lonely and who simply want friends are willing to say or do anything in order to have your company. But that also means that when they have said and done everything they need to get your company, when they're no longer when you're no longer useful to them, then they're gone. So cultivating genuine friendship is the third key to, to greatness. Number four, surround yourself with the best people rather than the yes people. Abraham Lincoln's political genius rests in the fact that he chose men to work with him who not only disagreed with him, but disagreed with each other. So you can imagine, during probably our greatest national crisis, the Civil War, you have men both from the North and from the South who disagree with each other over the question of slavery, over the question of what to do with the South once it's restored, if it's restored to the United States. Really touchy issues. Most men would have folded under the pressure. So Lincoln elects people who disagree with him, they disagree with each other, and they argue a lot, all the time. Lincoln always makes the final decisions during the crisis, but he never makes those decisions without listening to everyone say their piece. Nothing will ruin your potential for greatness faster than having men and women around you who only flatter you. We need people who will also point out our faults and our failings and help us to become better at whatever it is we're doing. Number five, never stop being enchanted by life. C.S. Lewis once said that we have never met an ordinary person. Think of what our relationships would be like if we thought of each other as extraordinary every day instead of what we usually do, which is to take each other for granted. Being enchanted means most of the time that we're enchanted by the people who are around us, by what they contribute, by what they do, and sometimes simply for who they are. C.S. Lewis exemplifies this enchantment beautifully when you consider the fact that he didn't get married until late in life. He was in his mid-50s. And he was only married for four years before his wife died of cancer. About a year after that, while he was crushed and exhausted by the grief that he felt, he was able to write these, these words about reading. Those of us who have been true readers all our life seldom fully realize the enormous extension of our being which we owe to authors. We realize it best when we talk with an unliterary friend. He may be full of goodness and good sense, but he inhabits a tiny world. In it, we should be suffocated. The man who is contented to be only himself 
and therefore less a self, is in prison. My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through those of others. Reality, even seen through the eyes of many, is not enough. I will see what others have invented. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself. Like the night sky in the Greek poem, I see with a myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. Here, as in worship, in love, in moral action, and in knowing, I transcend myself and am never more myself than when I do. Number six, persevere even when there seems to be no good reason to do so. Lincoln wrote this, adhere to your purpose and you will soon feel as well as you ever did. On the contrary, if you falter and give up, you will lose the power of keeping any resolution and will, re and will regret it all your life. A couple of years ago, I moved down here to Fort Worth, Texas from Des Moines, Iowa, where I had lived for the first 36 years of my life. I had gotten an opportunity to come study at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary for a PhD. My wife kind of had to talk me into it. It's been one of the best experiences and one of the worst experiences in my life. I got down here to Texas and started my program and my supervisor, my doctoral supervisor, was dismissed. And that threw me into a panic. I thought, what am I going to do now? I don't have a doctoral supervisor. There's a chance that, uh, that this program, I'm going to get this degree and it's going to be all for nothing. And I remember having a conversation with my wife on several occasions that first year. She was back in, in Iowa while I was here because she, she, just, she wasn't able to move down right away. We had uh, financial obligations. As I said, we still own our home there. We still um, had things we needed to take care of in Des Moines. So my wife continued to work by herself and I continued to study here by myself. One of the worst years of my life, I think. So we're talking, and on one occasion I said, I really just feel like quitting. And my wife says, if you quit, I'm walking out. <laughs> and I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't know if eventually it'll lead to teaching or what it will lead to. But I have to see the thing through. Because if I don't, and this is what my wife told me initially. She said, if you don't try this, if you don't give this a shot, you will always wonder what would have happened if you had. And she's right, of course. My wife is probably the best business manager I've ever had. <laughs> and last, number seven, be willing and ready always to acknowledge the help of others in getting where you are. I put it this way to myself. My life is the product of the generosity of others. None of us gets to where we want to be or where we are without the help of other people. Again, I think of my wife. She has stood by me through 13 or 14 years tops of college work. Or I think of people who give me rides to work or uh, to school or my mother or having brothers and uh, a sister that look up to me. There are all kinds of reasons to be grateful for how others help us. Now the hard part about giving a talk like this is that one is always reminded of how far one has yet to go in order to measure up to the standards that one sets for oneself. But we can begin small. We can start small by implementing some of these principles, some of these key points for greatness. Thank you. <laughs>